reserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. They give us strength. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. that are just as true today as they were when they were given. Lord, you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that gives us great confidence as we come to you and declare your greatness. And we do this because you are great. You are all-powerful, all-knowing. You are ever-present. And we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to have such a wonderful relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection and that you are the resurrection and the life. Father, thank you so much for sending your only son so that we could be freed from the bondage of sin. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you brought us comfort and that you brought us conviction so that we knew that we needed a Savior and you pointed us to the one who could set us free. Triune God, you are holy, you are awesome, and we come together as millions of other believers around the world are doing right now to praise you, to honor you, to love you, to adore you. You are magnificent. Lord, you are beyond description, and we are so grateful today that we can come and assemble in your name. We thank you for those joining us via live stream. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a time where technology can truly draw us together in moments like this. We pray, Lord, that all of us together 
will again worship you in spirit and in truth and that we will leave this time with a deeper understanding of what we must do to be Christ followers. Thank you for everyone who's gathered. We pray for those who are struggling right now in different ways. We pray that they would understand your peace and your purpose for them. Thank you, Lord, for all good things come from you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, welcome. You may be seated. Hey, say hi to those around you if you are here today. And if you're watching via live stream, if you've got people with you, hey, reach out to them and embrace each other. I do want to ask Susan Bly to come up and she's going to take us right into July's verse. Cool. All right. Let's get ready. Let's all say this together. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.13. And let's do that again. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing 
nothing else, nothing else will do. we just want you. There's nothing else in this world that matters. Lord, as we look at our worship, it is just the one thing that we look for. In your word, it says, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. We take away the busyness of the week, and we come here and we sit and we stand at your feet and we give you the worship. Let's stand together. And let's sing about that one thing, which is his amazing love.
That you're reckless with us. You love us with no consequences. When we think of reckless, we think of man's. But Lord, your reckless love goes beyond our comprehension because you go after that one 
and you leave the 99. You come after us no matter what we do, and your arms are open to love us and to welcome us. And Lord, we thank you so much for that. We come to worship you. We come to love you. We come to praise you. Thank you in Jesus' name. And I'd like to introduce Jackie and Jill, come on up, who have a special number for us today. Them think you're happy. Lie and say that things are fine. And hide that empty longing that you feel. Don't ever show it. Just keep your heart concealed. The day is so lonely. I wonder where, where can the heart go free? And who will dry the tears that no one sees? There must be someone to share. For a friend, where can you turn? Whisper the words of a prayer, and you'll find him there, arms open wide, love in his eyes. Jesus, he meets you where you are. Oh, oh Jesus, he heals your
I'd like you to take your Bibles again today and turn to where we were last week. We're looking at the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 28. Let's read these verses together as you see them on the screen. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. And I pray now that you would give us understanding of your word as well. Lord, we appreciate you. You care very deeply for us. And we were reminded of that in the music that we heard, that we participated with. Lord, we thank you that you are the friend of a broken heart. Lord, we thank you that even when we do not acknowledge our hurt and our loneliness to other people, you see it, you know it. And Lord, you're ready to embrace us. Lord, we see that today as we continue in this message. Lord, this is what happens when we trust you. We've just read the words. And I'm praying that you would help us to determine to choose to do what we must do for this to come to pass. Lord, it is a real promise. But as your people, we must do what is necessary to bring this promise into our realm and to live it out. Lord, your word will not fail. You always do what you say you will do. Give us insight today so that we will take up the responsibility that is ours to take. So that we can truly live Isaiah 40 verse 31 out and be overcomers. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, at the beginning of Isaiah 40, the people of Judah are in captivity in Babylon. We went through some of the history last week. One question loomed large for these exiles, and that question was, can we move forward? Since they had clearly failed to be God's faithful, obedient people, did they have a future? Here's some other questions. Would they have the strength to start again, to pick up the pieces and to move forward? Would God again work in their midst or would he simply abandon them? So in this crisis of faith, God again speaks to his people through his prophet Isaiah. Chapter 40 has two major sections. Some Bible teachers highlight these sections in this way. They say verses 1 through 9 contains God's proclamation of forgiveness and redemption with verse 10 tying it into the second part, verses, uh, excuse me, um, with verse 10 starting the second part of this um, section. And it is an, an extended hymn of praise to God. Verse 9 is what brings those two sections together. Other teachers highlight Isaiah 40 this way. They say that the first 11 verses prophesy about the Messiah and his predecessor, the messenger sent to announce his coming. And that, of course, would be John the Baptist. And then verses 12 through 31 list the magnificent attributes of God for us to know. So, 
it doesn't matter what camp you're in or what position you take, all Bible scholars believe that Isaiah chapter 40 is absolutely for the people of God in that time to be comforted and to be encouraged. And as we look at it today in our realm, we can gain hope, comfort. We gain knowledge of God's redemptive ability and desire in our lives. I want to look quickly at the verses once again that point to the verses that we just read. Last week we read all of them. We're not going to do that today, but we're going to take a few of those verses and highlight them because it helps us truly understand the power that is available to us that will give us the strength and the ability to become overcomers. It's always important to look at the context. And so I've picked out a few verses. First of all, verses two and three, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. After years of captivity, experiencing God's chastening for their repeated rejection and their sins, God's people are now being comforted by the words of the prophet. They are words of forgiveness and redemption. Verse 3 is not only referring to the present situation that the Jews were in, in Babylon, but it does also point to the future when John the Baptist will be pointing out to the earthly ministry of redemption to Jesus, to all the people that are there. Remember, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In verse 25, we read this, to whom then will you liken me or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. This is a summary. Verse 25 is a summary to conclude the section just before it, verses 19 through 24. If God is paramount over idols, we see that in verses 19 and 20. And he is over nature, we see that in verse 22. And he is over mankind, all of humanity, we see that in verses 23 and 24. To whom can he be likened? He, is he not altogether unique and incomparable? Look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Verse 26, obviously, is one more appeal through creation. It proves God's greatness. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Psalm 147 verses 4 and 5 says, He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power is his understanding. And it is infinite. Omnipotence alone could have created the starry host. God is all powerful. That alone. He could have created it all. And he did. But omniscience is required to know their number and their names. Not only is he all-powerful, he is all-knowing. I sometimes have problems with my kids' names. God knows the name of every star. Isn't that amazing? He is all-powerful. He is omniscient. You know, while in Babylon, and I really believe the prophet spoke this because as we read the historical account of the, the Jews in Babylon, they were under a lot of, of education. And the Babylonians were, were known for their stargazing. And it is said that they 
they often would teach anyone in the kingdom what the names of the constellations were. So the Jews, having spent all these years in captivity, would have known that. And now the prophet is, is actually bringing them into a much higher realm. God not just knows the names of the constellations, he knows the name of every single star in the heaven. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. And if he knows all of the stars, he knows every name here on earth. That's our God. The prophet is making this, this big statement, this declaration. Because these people have questions about how they can go forward. Is God really there? Is he for them? Are they able to do what God is now giving them an open door to do and leave Babylon and go back to their country. Well, here's one more. We see in verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. If God were for a moment, just a moment, to faint or be weary or to slumber or to sleep. The whole fabric of nature would fail and disappear. There would be universal chaos. All moral order would cease. And probably all existence except his own would sink into nothingness. God is wholly free from whatever is weak or defective in us in our realm. He never fails. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. This is what the people are being told before Isaiah brings them to the point that he tells them God has power for them. Psalm 121 says this, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by nay, by day, the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So the Israelites are ending their time of captivity and the call to return to their land is now there. Much of their land is in ruins. The original questions now that we propose are likely being asked. Do we really have a future? Do we have the strength to start again, to pick up the pieces, to rebuild, to move forward? Will God again work in our midst? Or has he abandoned us? You understand where they are. Everything that they knew is gone. They have been in a foreign land under foreign rule for 70 years. The majority of the people that came out of the land into captivity are gone. And now there are a few that remember the days. They might remember the temple. They might remember the walls around Jerusalem. Now they understand by all the reports that there is nothing left. And God is now saying, comfort my people. All of this brought on as a consequence of their unbelief, their own mistakes. This is where they are. And yet the prophet tells them that God is going to be with them. They're not going to be able to do it in their own strength. They aren't. In fact, look at verse 30. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. That is where the strength lies in any nation. And they're going to fail. Their strength is not going to be enough. 
It's important for us to get this because if we are truly going to understand what verse 33 is saying, we have to get the backstory. Maybe some of you right now are, are in a hard place. Just like the Israelites, you're looking at something before you and because of of mistakes that you've made because of your own sin, because you rejected the word of God. You are now in a place where to go forward looks almost impossible. The spirit of God has been working in you. The spirit of God has brought conviction. Your heart has turned from stone to now flesh. You're softening. You're saying, I want to go forward. I want God's forgiveness. I want his redemption. But the task in front of me looks undaunting. It it looks daunting. It looks intimidating. In fact, it is potential for me to fail again. You need to understand. If you're in that place and God is stirring your heart to take that step of faith to begin that new life, to see his renewal take place, to be willing to rebuild, to go forward even though it looks impossible and is impossible for you to do on your own. This promise is for you. But those who wait on the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not weary. They shall walk and not faint. In the power of God, you will be able to do even what the strongest men cannot do. That is absolutely incredible. This is God's promise to his people. The first 30 verses of Isaiah chapter 40 give us an amazing picture of God's message of comfort. His forgiveness, his redemption, his power, his wisdom, his eternal presence are all accentuated. There is no God like Jehovah. No kingdom, no king or prince on earth can stand in the presence of the king of the universe. He is the one now who comes and says to his people, have you not heard? Have you not known? He is reminding them of everything that they've already been taught. All of the years, all of the centuries, the prophets that have gone before them have told them they've experienced God. This is the God now that is calling you back and is going to give you the strength to do it. To be an overcomer. And that, that is where we come in. Could it, could it be that there is someone here today, and I'll say it again, who's been in a relentless struggle. You have been wearied unmercifully. You have been in a period of chastening, resulting from your disobedience. Or perhaps you're just in a desert experience. You've been in a dry and parched land. And you are now asking questions. Do I have a future? Do I have strength to start again? Do I have the strength to pick up the pieces, to rebuild, to move forward? Will God again work in my life? Or will he simply abandon me? To apply the word of God here, we have to understand the word Wait. What does verse 31 again say? But those who wait on the Lord. I have here with me today a Strong's Concordance. Just interested, uh, how many of you own a Strong's Concordance? Okay. How many of you use one online? This, if, if there 
were two books that I could have in my life, and only two books. One, obviously, would be the Bible. The second one would be Strong's Concordance. The word wait in Hebrew, and I am not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm going to pronounce it, and you don't know if it's a correct pronunciation or not, and neither do I. But it's, it is quava. Q-A-V-A-H. It's quava. Now, when you and I look at the word wait, we have this idea that comes into our mind that that, that is a, a, a figurative term, most of us. Um, it can be literal, but we're seeing it as wait means that we're having confidence, that we're, we have expectant, assured hope of God, and, and, and we're basing that on the word of God, and, and we need to be in that realm of expectancy. We need to be waiting we need to have an expectancy that God's help, that God's strength will be there. And that, that certainly is good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't really give us the meaning that comes from the original Hebrew. The literal meaning is this, to bind together like a cord. The twisting or winding of a strand of cord, a rope, or a cable. So, when you read those who wait on the Lord, does that come to mind? It, it really doesn't. The Hebrew is a wonderful language. One word, and Tamil's a great language too. Daisy often uh, reminds me that um, it's very difficult for her to put into English. She has to put a whole bunch of words together to explain one Tamil word. And that's the way it is with the Hebrew. So Strong's Concordance gives us a way to now understand differently. And it helps us to go to other places in scripture where that same word, quava, is used. So it gives even greater understanding and meaning what it means for us to do. Because the Bible says clearly, those who quava, those who wait on the Lord, will do what? Renew their strength. So I want to be able to do what the Scripture is telling me to do. I visited the Golden Gate Bridge out in San Francisco, California with Tim Caterino many years ago. Tim Caterino was a church planner, a missionary, and I had traveled to Thailand with him a few times. And we also went into Burma where we saw just great and mighty things before our eyes. And as I was standing at the Golden Gate Bridge... They have a, an area that you can go to. It's, it's a park that actually you can walk around. And they have a uh, piece of the cable that they use to help the bridge in its suspension. And it will um, uh, keep the bridge from obviously falling into the ocean. That cable is huge. Now, when I say huge, it, it's me. I can stand in front of that cable, and that cable takes up my five foot eight structure. It is gigantic. And they have it cut so that you can actually look and see that cable. That cable that is used to bear the weight of the bridge is made up of thousands and thousands of little strands of wire. 
and they form individual cables that are then put together, twisted together, to make this massive cable. One strand, one wire, obviously is not going to hold up much weight because it doesn't have strength. However, a cable can lift hundreds, thousands, millions of pounds in the case of the, the bridge because it consists of many strands. When a cable lifts or pulls a load, it stretches and it stretches enough that it becomes taut. And while the stress is on the cable, the individual strands work together to lift or to pull the load. No one individual strand does all the work. If it did, it would snap. The cable's strength comes from all of the strands working together. The literal definition of quava implies strength through numbers. The more strands in your cable or rope, the greater is its strength. A cable's strength comes from being made of many strands. So as Christ followers, our strength comes through being united with Christ. The cable of our lives gains strength by being twisted or woven or bound together with the king of the universe. We get that. But sometimes what we don't get is this. With all of that in mind, we need to recognize that what we do in our everyday lives is of the utmost important to be called people who are waiting on the Lord. I can put it to you in this way. We need to develop many strands of trust in our life. The more strands we bring into our life that are all part of our relationship with the Lord, the more strength from the Lord we actually experience. So this is what I'm saying. This is the simplicity of being a Christ follower. It's the stuff that we know intellectually, but it's the stuff that we forget to apply in our life on a daily basis, and I am at the front of the line in this. This is how we actually wait on the Lord. First of all, our focus is on him. When we wake up in the morning, what's the first thought in your mind? It should be the Lord. When Daisy and I pray at night, the, one of the things that we pray is, Lord, put your song in our heart when we wake up in the morning. This morning, when I actually woke up, I was right in this place. I was listening to a song this week, and the song was asking a question, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the obvious answer is no, nothing is too hard for the Lord. That was the first thought that popped into my mind. And the second thought was this, Lord, thank you for bringing that thought into my mind because today I want to live in that way. Nothing is too hard for you. Ask God to do that for you. When you go to sleep at night, ask him to be the one who is singing over you. The scripture says that during the night. Ask him to be the one to put that first thought into your mind about him. Focus on God. Focus on God the next hour that you are continuing now your journey during the day. Focus on him during the day. Take time where you are pausing just to be thankful, just to say, God, you created all of this that I'm seeing right now, all this around me. You are the great creator. Focus on God. That's one strand. Secondly, apply and study the word of God. We know that intellectually. We can even quote verses on it. 
One verse is this, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Another verse is 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We know that. We can go to the book of James and, and we know it isn't enough to say we believe, but we have to act out our belief as well. We have to study and apply the word of God. That's another strand. We need to be praying daily as we go through our job, as we go through our conversations, as we just are driving down the road. We need to be in that mindset where at any moment, at any time, we can call on God. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. That's another strand. And here's a strand that a lot of people have forgotten about. And that is attend church regularly. Be in a fellowship regularly. Doesn't mean you just have to come to a Sunday service, but get with other believers. Anytime believers are together, there is a local body right there. It's a local church. Hang out with other believers. And we need to do it even more so as we see the day approaching. And I don't know about you, but I truly see the day is approaching. And that trumpet is going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the kind of stuff you get when you are with other believers. We said this a while ago, as believers, when we know that the Lord is coming, shouldn't we at least say one word to each other? Maranatha. The Lord is going to return. There's another strand. We need to learn from Christian friends. In Proverbs, we're told, he who walks with wise men will be wise. Walk with people who are going to give you good counsel. Iron sharpens Iron. There's another strand. Tell others about your faith in Jesus. The more you and I talk about Jesus in our life, the stronger we become. And that strand of witnessing gets added to all of the others that we are actively engaged in. Tell people about what Jesus has done for you. Man, if something good has happened to you and an unbeliever is there and an unbeliever says, hey, what's new? You don't have to hold back. Tell them what's new. Do you remember the demon-possessed man from Gadarenes when he was healed and all those demons were, were removed? He said, Jesus, I want to go with you. What did Jesus tell him? No, you need to go home and tell everybody. Tell them all. They were unbelievers. And Jesus wanted them to see the power of God that touched that man and the glory of God is revealed. Boy, that's another strand. Forgive. Forgive those who have come up against you. Forgive those that even haven't sought for your forgiveness. That's another strand. Because when you forgive, you're taking on the image of Christ who has forgiven you. Worship the Lord. Wherever we are, we need to worship him. Worship him through our work. Worship, worship him through our speech. Worship him when no one is around. Worship him in your car. Worship him in your room, in your closet. Worship the Lord. Bow down before him, just as Mary did at the feet of Jesus. And recognize his great love for you. Worship the Lord. That's another strand. We need to deny ourselves. Take up our cross. Follow him. There's another strand. We need to fear God. Keep his commandments. Another strand. The list goes on and on. And when you twist all of these strands together... You get a rope or you get a cable whose strength then comes from God. It isn't your strength. It's God's strength. Everything that we just described, that's in God. That's for God. That's with God. That's by God. 
One Bible scholar actually gives the verse, verse 31, with words like this. I kind of like this. And he's doing the best he can with the Hebrew. They that have all aspects of their lives intertwined and bound together with the Lord, like the threads of a rope, shall exchange their meager strength for the strength of the Lord. They shall rise to meet challenges as if they had powerful wings like an eagle. They shall run through life and not be weary. They shall walk through problems and not faint. So next time you and I read that verse, those that wait on the Lord, think of the word quava. And recognize that it's important for you and I to take these strands that we've mentioned today and twist them together in your daily experience because by doing that, you are waiting on the Lord and you are giving him opportunity to make you as an overcomer. He's talking to people that had all kinds of questions. They had all kinds of problems and struggles. Their future looked pretty bad from a human point of view. And yet, he is telling them, it's okay. I'm bringing you words of comfort. I'm calling you back to your land. And I am going to give you extraordinary strength. Wait on me. If that's where you are today, wait on the Lord. Do it in that way. As you go through your life, these simple things that we've just talked about, they're simple we all know them. We would say, amen. Yep, yep, we should do that as Christians. Then do them. That's what I say to me. Sometimes Daisy wonders who I'm talking to. And I'm looking at the mirror, literally, at myself saying, Dave, just do this. Do this. We need to encourage ourselves. And we need to encourage each other. These are the individual strands twisted together that will allow God's power to work. And then we will not only be able to quote that verse and understand the experience that that verse describes, but we will be able to say this too. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, I pray that you would help us understand the application of your word. Lord, I pray that we would make it our purpose to have these strands twisting together, coming together to form that unbreakable strong cable that can bear up under any load and know that it's not our strength, but it is truly coming from you. Because the more we involve you in every aspect of our life, the more strength that we have and we are truly waiting on you. It is an amazing concept for us to understand. Thank you for the prophet Isaiah. Thank you for the word that he chose. And I thank you, Lord, for Bible scholars that give us opportunity to benefit from their heavy study in the Hebrew language. Lord, we thank you that your word cannot change. It cannot alter. And Lord, as you bring us into different passages like this and you stir our hearts with a verse like this, then Lord, we need to truly investigate and evaluate and understand who we are and who you are and do what the word is telling us to do. That's how we'll become overcomers. Lord, as we've said before, you really don't care about our good intentions, but you do care about what we do or don't do. Lord, help us to do what you have told people to do, to just follow you in every area of our life. Lord, if there's anyone here that is overcome by addiction, Lord, may they start putting these strands in their life to give them the opportunity of having renewal and to soar like an eagle over that addiction and to be an overcomer. 
Lord, if there's anyone here just hurting, struggling, they just feel that they've made too many mistakes. And even though they know you are a merciful God, they still have a problem with proceeding. Lord, I pray again, they would take these strands one at a time, put them together, that they may experience your renewing strength. Any other issue, Lord, that's here? Anyone watching via live stream, Lord, I pray that you would just meet them right where, where they are. Lord, we heard the song today. We heard the words from the parable that the shepherd left the 99 so he could go find the lost sheep. Lord, it could be we have lost sheep out there today and you are right there. You're calling for them. You're ready to just embrace them. Lord, I pray that they would do what the prodigal son did in the parable and turn towards you and repent of sin. Lord, help us all. Lord, if there's anyone listening that does not know you, I pray through the power of your spirit, you will bring them to that place that you brought me so many years ago. You brought me to that place where I understood I needed a savior. My sin was great and it separated me from you. And there was no hope for me outside of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that anyone who has not experienced your salvation will today be drawn to the fact that they need a savior and that you are that savior. You died on the cross of Calvary. You took the penalty for their sin. You were buried three days later. You did what only the Son of God could do. You rose from the dead. And today you invite them to come to you, repent of sin, and by faith receive that free gift of God, which is eternal life through you. Lord, I pray that you would just bring people to that place. Lord, we can plead with them. We can encourage them, but we know it's by your spirit. And I just pray for the freedom of your spirit, Lord. We don't want to quench your spirit. We don't want to grieve your spirit. Lord, it's too important because there are masses of people going out into eternity, condemned to hell forever. And Lord, they need to come to you. And if, Lord, you can just impress that on them. Lord, please, please. Just impress that today is the day of salvation. Lord, we thank you for listening to our prayers. We thank you, Lord, that you are the mighty God. You are the king of the universe. And we thank you that you love us so much. And I pray that our love will grow today as we just continue to be so thankful for the never-ending love that you've given to us. Lord, we sang the song about reckless love, and, and that word literally means without error, without any flaw at all. That's your love for us, for me. Thank you, Lord. Have mercy on your people today. And yes, Lord, we do pray that you would renew us and give us that strength that we can be overcomers. And we pray this through the blood of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, God bless you. We do thank you again for um, your faithfulness and praying for each other. Remember, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Have a wonderful rest of this Lord's day.